Bueno, hola a todos. Eh, hoy cerramos ya el ciclo de presentaciones y está Ariel Chimman, eh, que Eduardo va a ser la presentación más apropiada de él, así que para mí fue un gusto haber hecho todo este ciclo y haber tenido tan lindos invitados. Y, y bueno, adelante Edu. Buen día a todos. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those uh, already past noon somewhere else in the world. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to uh, have here Ariel Chipman. Uh, he is a researcher and professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He uh, did there his uh, Bachelor of Science, Master of Science and PhD in biology. And then he moved to the University of Cambridge to make a postdoc at Michael Aikam's uh, laboratory, working on centipedes. And that's where he started working on arthropods and the evolution of segmentation. After that, he worked on crayfish. And then he went back to the University of Jerusalem, his alma mater, uh, to work and establish a program on the milkweed bag on Copeltus fasciarus which is an hemipteran and, and somehow straddles uh, a phylogenetic between you know, the more, uh, basal flying insects and the holometabolous insect. And so he's here today. He's gonna be talking about uh, the evolution of uh, the arthropod body plant. So we welcome him. Thanks, Ariel, and it's all yours. Thank you, gracias. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I won't try and say something in Spanish, even though I you know, could say good morning, but um, I'll stick with, with uh, English. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, this is actually really exciting being able to give a talk um, to almost the other side of the planet, both uh, the other hemisphere and the other side of the equator. Um, so, you know, the magic of, of technology and uh, the world that we're living in that has sort of forced us to think differently about how we interact and where we can give seminars. And of course, you know, a year ago, if Eduardo would have invited me to come to uh, give a talk, we would have to think about flights and, and funding and, and uh, accommodation and what I would eat, et cetera, which is of course the most important question. But now I can just join you through Zoom and uh, I hope this is interesting. So you've heard several talks, um, you've had some excellent speakers. I think you've been very lucky and Eduardo has, has gotten some really good people together to talk to you. What I want to talk about specifically uh, is the arthropod body plan and to show how we can use different sources of data and different approaches to understand the, the complex story of the evolution of the arthropod body plan. Uh, so, okay, one problem I just realized is that I don't actually have a clock anywhere visible at the moment when I'm sharing my screen. So Eduardo, can you just sort of give me time calls at a few points along the way just so I don't run too far over time? Sure, anytime. Okay, uh, so um, I like to start with this very famous quote. This is probably the most one of the most famous quotes in evolutionary biology and, and every textbook starts with it. So nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This comes from the famous evolutionary biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky, who at the time was in Columbia University in New York. And actually this quote comes from a lecture he gave to uh, biology teachers. So everybody thinks it's, it's part of some paper, but it's actually a, a lecture to teachers. I like to take this quote and reverse it, turn it on its head. And I like to say that everything in biology provides evidence for evolution. So if you're interested in studying evolution, basically anything you look at in biology, any process, any, um, any phenomenon you look at in biology will give you evidence for evolutionary processes and the evolutionary history of whatever it is you're looking at. And if we're interested in evolution, I think the corollary of this is that you should be looking at everything. So in the example that, that I'll elaborate on um, over the next hour and a half, if I'm interested in the evolution of the arthropod body plan, I should be using everything I know about the arthropod body plan to understand its evolution. And that means both comparatively looking at, at arthropods today and looking at the fossil record, and looking at developmental processes, Ivo Divo, which you heard about from Armin last week, 
I'm looking at genomics, comparative genomics, which is um, a field that, that Eduardo and I have interacted on uh, over the last few years. But basically everything in biology will give you evidence for the evolutionary process you're interested in studying. My interests over the past, I guess, more than 20 years, um, actually it's frightening how probably closer to 25 years, have been in the evolution of body plans. So what do I mean when I say the evolution of body plans? I mean the evolution of the fundamental characteristics of an organism. So does it have a head? Um, does it have radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry? Is its body organized into segments? Does it have some kind of repeating units? Um, does it have a dorsal ventral axis? Does it have any shape? So these really major fundamental organizational properties of the animal, where do they come from? How do they change? Now, usually we tend to think of a body plan as more or less equivalent with a phylum. So we have the chordates or the vertebrates, for example, that have a head, they have a tail behind the anus, um, they have a, a skull, they have a, a spinal column, etc. So those are the characteristics of a phylum. Um, the cnidarians here are characterized by radial symmetry, by having only two germ layers, by having stinging cells. So each one of these fundamental characteristics of a body plan uh, usually characterizes a phylum. Now, of course, even though I'm, I'm interested in comparative biology and I'm interested in, I guess, in animal diversity in general, one can't work on all the phyla in the world. And so I focus on one phylum, which also happens to be the most interesting and the most diverse and the most exciting phylum, and those are the arthropods. Uh, so the arthropods make up a vast majority of all animals on the planet today. Um, there are well over a million described species, probably 1.2 million described species, and probably three or four times that undescribed species. They include the insects, such as butterflies and bugs. They include crustaceans, such as this crab here and this um, um, isopod here, um, the arachnids, including scorpions and spiders, and the myriapods, including centipedes and millipedes, which I don't have in this picture. And of course, they have a, a significant fossil record, so we know a lot not only about the arthropods that live today, but also about arthropods that lived in the past. And we also know that arthropods are not only the dominant phylum on Earth today, they've been the dominant phylum on Earth for the past 500 million years. So definitely a, a very interesting group to work on. And they also exhibit huge diversity in shapes, in ecology, uh, in specifications and specializations, uh, in feeding strategies, and almost any subject you want to study, you can study on arthropods just because there's so many of them and they're so diverse. The main defining character of arthropods as a phylum or a defining character of the arthropod body plan is the fact that they're organized into segments. So segments are repeated complex units along the anterior posterior axis. So in this crustacean here, each one of these numbered units is a segment. Now a segment is not just the cuticle, it's not just the external um, division of the, of the body wall into, into hinges, into, into individual units. Every one of these segments is a complex unit that includes components of different, of different um, body systems. So it includes a piece of exoskeleton, a piece of the external skeleton, but it also, if you look inside, it includes a repeating, repeating muscle, muscle units. It includes repeating nervous units, a, a ganglion for each segment, at least primitively. Um, it includes elements of various other systems. So each one of these segments is a complex unit and these segments repeat themselves along the anterior posterior axis from the front to the back. In addition to the segmented body, arthropods also have segmented limbs and the name arthropod actually refers to their segmented limbs. So arthropodization is the segmentation or the division of the limbs into um, repeating function, functional units that can move relative to one another. Just a, a clarification of terminology. When I say segmentation, segmentation actually refers to two different things. It refers to the morphological phenomenon, the fact that arthropods are made out of segments. So we call that segmentation. So the, the phenomenon of segmentation is being divided into these segments. 
But segmentation also refers to the developmental process that generates segments. So if I'm interested in the evolution of segmentation, I'm interested in both the evolution of the morphological phenomenon, the evolution of the fact that arthropods and other groups are made up of segments. And I'm also interested in the evolution of the developmental process, the process that generates these repeated units that makes these segments. And study of segmentation has been the focus of the work, uh, both in my postdoc and in my own lab. So again, for 17 years or so, I've been working on the evolution of segmentation. And this is a, a fascinating, this is a fascinating process to study because segmentation is, is so fundamental to, to arthropods and because we actually know quite a bit about it and I'll, I'll elaborate um, over the, the, the rest of the talk. Another important phenomenon worth mentioning when talking about arthropods is the phenomenon of tagmatization. So tagmatization is the fact that segments are not all identical and they're not distributed randomly or uniformly, but the segments are actually organized into distinct functional units. So this is best known in insects. So insects are made up of a head, thorax, and abdomen. And each one of these units, each one of these tagmata, so the singular is tagma and the plural is tagmata. So each one of these tagmata is in itself made up of numerous segments. So the head is made up of six segments and the thorax of three and the abdomen of nine to 11 segments. If we look at myriapods, their organization is simpler. They have only a head and then a trunk where all the segments are the same. If we look at chelicerates or arachnids, they're divided into two functional units, two tegmata, a prosoma, also known sometimes as a cephalothorax, and a opistosoma, sometimes also known as the abdomen. So arthropods are made up of repeated units, segments. These segments are organized into functional units. And some or most of these segments also have on them segmented limbs. So that, in a nutshell, is the arthropod body plan. So segments, tegmatization, and arthropodized limbs. And there are a few other characters, but those are the main things that define the arthropod body plan. So I talked about segmentation as a process. And in fact, most of what we know, or most of what we knew about segmentation, about the process, the developmental process of segmentation in arthropods up to 15 years ago was from work in the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. In fact, we can even say that developmental genetics, so the study of the genetics of developmental processes was really invented or discovered in the early studies of segmentation in Drosophila in the 1970s up to the early 1980s in the lab of uh, Christiane nusslein volhart in Germany. And she and her colleagues received the Nobel Prize for that work. And what nusslein volhart and her colleagues discovered is that the process of segmentation, the process of generation of the repeated complex units in Drosophila is a fairly well-organized process um, that involves this hierarchical subdivision of an early embryonic rudiment, which we call the germ band, into smaller and smaller units through the interaction of a series of genes, mostly transcription factors. I'll explain what those are in the next few slides. So the process starts with a series of genes or factors known as maternal determinants that really tell the embryo which way is front and which way is back, which way is dorsal or top and which way is ventral or bottom. Then there's a series of genes known as gap genes that are expressed in defined broad domains within the embryo. If you knock one of them out, then you get a gap in the embryo. That's where the name comes from. Gap genes interact and activate a series of genes known as peril genes, primary and secondary peril genes. These genes are expressed every other segment. So either in even segments or in odd segments. And then the interactions between these parallel genes activate a series of genes known as segment polarity genes. And the segment polarity genes are the genes that actually define the segmental units. They define the borders between the units that in the mature organism will be the complex segments that I mentioned early on. So this is the baseline. This is what uh, we knew. This is where we first started learning about segmentation. And hundreds or even thousands of labs in the world over the past 40 years have been working on different aspects of this segmentation process in Drosophila. And more and more in the past few years, we've been working on segmentation process in other species. Uh, and of course, I will talk about that. 
So just a few terms. Um, so I, I don't know whether everyone knows these terms, just to clarify and make sure that everybody is, is on the same page. Most of the genes, most of these genes, the genes involved in the what we call the Drosophila segmentation cascade, belong to a group of genes known as transcription factors. So trans transcription factors are genes that, of course, like any gene, are transcribed into messenger RNA and then translated to give a protein, which is a transcription factor. And these proteins bind to the control regions of other genes and either turn them on or turn them off. So being very simplistic, a transcription factor is a gene that turns on other genes. And usually transcription factors turn on or turn off other genes within the same cell. Another group of genes worth mentioning are genes encoding signaling pathways or signaling genes. And there's several different families of signaling pathways. I'll mostly talk about the wind signaling pathway and the hedgehog signaling pathway. So these are genes that encode for usually small proteins that travel between cells, bind to a receptor. So that's, this will be the gene would be, or the product of the gene would be this little orange thing here. They would bind to some kind of receptor in the target cell, activate a series of intracellular uh, messengers and ultimately activate genes. So a signaling gene is a gene that activates other genes, but in a different cell. So between transcription factors and signaling pathways, we can build these complex gene regulatory networks. And most of development we now know is made up of these interactions between transcription factors and signaling molecules to give, so a GRN is a gene regulatory network. That's a term I'll use quite a bit throughout this talk. These gene regulatory networks are the actual effectors of developmental processes. And when studying the evolution of development, and I'm building on things that Armin talked about last week, when studying the evolution of development, most of what we want to understand is how these different genes interact and how they organize into networks. And I know that Armin said this last week, but the genes themselves tend to be extremely conserved. So we can find the same genes in almost any phylum, we look at the same major developmental genes will be found will be found in numerous phyla. In many cases, they'll even be involved in similar networks. But the differences in the interactions and the differences in the networks are what actually drives the differences in adult structure, in, in morphology, in phenomena such as segmentation. So if you want to understand the evolution of segmentation, we want to understand the evolution of the interactions between the transcription factors and signaling molecules that together generate the gene regulatory networks that drive evolution, that drive development and ultimately evolution. Specifically, this network is the blastoderm gene re regulatory network in the fruit fly Drosophila. This is the early acting network that does what I showed three slides ago. So this transition between gap genes, parallel genes, segment polarity genes. Of course, it's a fairly complex network. Uh, and it's probably the best understood network in biology. It's the network that most labs have worked on. And as I'll show you partially, it's also one of the networks that we know the most about its evolution. So I'll maybe take a two minute break here and see if there are any questions. Um, so Eduardo, do we want to have specific breaks for questions or do we want to leave questions to the end? So what most people is doing is they, they will uh, write questions through the talk on the channels, either from Zoom or uh, YouTube. So if when you and if they pause, we find a question, we can stop there and, and, and read it loud. Okay, so, so this is a good time to pause. If there are any questions, um, I'll have them now. If not, I'll continue and, and wait for questions. I, I have a short one. Yeah. Uh, in vertebrates, you also have segments. What yeah. are the difference between arthropods and vertebrates in the genetic basis? And, and how can we explain the, the diversity of arthropods uh, in, in comparison with vertebrates? Okay, so actually those are both questions that I'm going to talk about throughout the talk, but I'll just briefly answer the first one. Vertebrates are also made up of segments, but Vertebrate segments are very different from arthropod segments. There was a big debate for several years, and I'll elaborate that on that a bit later. There was a big debate whether they're homologous or not, and it's pretty clear now that they're not homologous. So they evolved convergently, both in arthropods um, and in vertebrates. The diversity we see in arthropods is largely through variations of 
the segmentation mechanism. And that's one of the main things that I'll, I'll talk about um, as I move on. Okay, any other questions? Nothing so far, okay. we can move on. Okay, so um, this is probably a statement of the type that you hear in many different talks, but I think that now is a very exciting time to start to study arthropod evolution. The, the field of arthropod evolution is undergoing a renaissance and explosion, and this is mostly due to three or four developments of the last few years. And I want to first quickly go over these developments that make it exciting to study arthropod evolution today. And then um, after that, I'll talk about a few specific questions in arthropod evolution that we can answer using these developments. So the first thing is that we have an ever increasing fossil record. The fossil record of arthropods is fantastic. Uh, now, you would tend to think, especially coming from Argentina, which is famous for its big dinosaur fossils uh, and fossilized trees and things like that, you would tend to think that something like arthropods doesn't fossilize very well. But in fact, there are several fossil sites across the world that have what is known as exquisite preservation or unusual Burgess shell type preservation, where we find soft tissues of arthropods preserved. Many of these sites are from very early in the evolution of the arthropod. So from the Cambrian or the Ordovician and Silurian. So from about 510 to about 400 million years ago, mostly around 500 million years ago. And these, these fossil sites give us an unprecedented window into early stages of arthropod evolution. Some of these sites have been known for more than 100 years, uh, such as this is um, famous Opobinia from the Burgess Shale site in Canada, which has been known since the early 20th century. Um, this is from a site in Morocco, I think. Uh, some of this is one is from Australia, but there are new sites being discovered all the time. The newest one, uh, Qingjiang from China was only, um, well, it was only advertised to the world a year and a half ago. It was probably known for about five or six years before that, uh, which has incredible <laughs> preservation of soft tissues similar to this one. But not only do we have, are we finding more and more fossils and there are new fossils coming out all the time, our understanding of the fossils and our ability to analyze them has gotten much better using new analytical techniques and new imaging tools. So these are a few examples of new imaging tools being used on ancient fossils, providing data that we could never get from the fossils just using simple optics. So this is, uh, I think, x-ray scatter of a fossil. This is what is known as elemental backscatter. So the different colors are different elements in the minerals making up this fossil. This is a CT scan, a uh, computer tomography scan of a Silurian fossil, which shows us incredible detail of the limbs and the, the even the little hairs on the limbs. This one is fantastic. This one is a confocal image, basically using the autofluorescence of the fossil putting it under a confocal microscope to see what we're looking at is the inside of the pharynx of a fossil, um, a Silurian fossil of a group known as euthycarcinoids. And this is, this is the jaw apparatus. So this is the connection of the mouth parts to the head capsule. And what the researchers were able to show here is that the connection of the mouth parts to the head capsule is similar to a type of connection that is only found in myriapods, only found in centipedes and millipedes. And this allowed them to say for the first time that these euthycarcinoids are probably ancestors of myriapods living today. So this is something that we couldn't do even five years ago. So just the ability to do this imaging and to analyze these fossils uh, to a level we were never able to, to before. And this gives us as I said, a window into the early evolution of the arthropod body plan, which we can then link with other sources of data to understand the body plan of arthropods today. A second development, which is not really new, but has been happening gradually over the past 20 years, is this improved understanding of developmental processes in a comparative framework. So this is what Evo Devo has done. And again, I'm, I'm building an Armin's talk from last week. The fact that we now understand not only how animals develop, but how animals of different types develop. We understand different modes of development. We, we understand how different types of body plans within arthropods um, develop. And this allows us to do comparative work and, and see how the body plan has evolved. 
and I'll devote most of my talk to specifics of the developmental processes and understanding how developmental processes vary between arthropods and from that how they evolve. This is um, a the summary picture from a paper from my lab from a few years ago, and I'll, I'll come back to this uh, and talk about it a bit later. A third development, which is again, not something that happened suddenly, but something that's been gradually developing, gradually improving over the past 10 years, is a much better phylogeny of both extant arthropods, that is arthropods that live today, and fossil arthropods, so arthropods that have been extinct for hundreds of millions of years. This has come through, um, the, the phylogeny of extant arthropods has mostly come through genomics. We now have genome sequences of numerous arthropods representing different groups. We have improved tools for analyzing these genomes and building trees using genomic and transcriptomic data. So even though it's dangerous to say in science that anything is known definitely, the phylogeny of arthropods or the, the evolutionary relationships between the main arthropod groups, we can say is probably solved. So it's consistent, different analyses, different sources of data give us pretty much the same tree. So I think we can say that at least the relationships between the major group of arthropods, we now have a tree that is robust and well supported and is probably correct. And we can see that in the top part of this tree over here. So these are the um, holometabolous insects, other insects, crustaceans, myriapods, um, chelicerates, and two outgroups to arthropods, the onocophorans and the tardigrades. The relationships between these two groups are fairly well, fairly well understood and fairly well supported. But we can map onto this same tree also the relationships of fossil arthropods. And these are all the, all the taxa, all of the names that are deeper within the tree, so not don't reach the top, this indicates that these are extinct groups. And using the improved fossil record and the improved imaging techniques and improved data on fossils and using the improved methods for phylogenetic reconstruction uh, that mostly grew out of genomics, we can now build a tree that includes not only the animals that exist today, but also many different fossil groups. And we can see that the fossil groups are actually placed in many different places within arthropod phylogeny. So these two fossils are probably closer to chelicerates, the, the arachnids. Uh, so this is, these are what we call the stem group chelicerates, so the closest fossil relatives to chelicerates that are not members of actual chelicerates, these two groups. Um, the euthycarcinoids, which I mentioned, the one from the confocal image, we can now say are stem group myriapods, so extinct close relatives of centipedes and millipedes, and then there's this whole group here, which are stem group arthropods. So these are animals that are not true arthropod, arthropods. They don't display all of the characters that define the arthropod body plan today, but they are the closest relatives, the closest fossil relatives to arthropods. And as we go through these fossils, the, the stem group arthropods, we can see how gradually the characters that define the arthropod body plan appear one at a time or several at a time as we move up the tree and get closer and closer to true arthropods. So we can use this fossil record and this phylogeny to really map the evolution of the arthropod body plan as it's represented in the fossil record. Questions up to now? No? Okay, so what I want to do now is to present three hypotheses about the evolution of the arthropod body plan. Um, all three of these hypotheses emerge from data from Evo Devo and from the fossil record, and all three of them are hypotheses that we can continue to study and elaborate on using, again, fossil record, Evo Devo, phylogenetics, genomics in some cases, so using different sources of data to test and elaborate these hypotheses. And what I'm going to do, I'll present each one of the hypotheses briefly in a few sentences, and then I'll go and elaborate on each one of them in much more detail. And I guess at the end of each hypothesis, I'll stop and see if there are any questions. So the first hypothesis, which I'll call hypothesis A, uh, is that segmental organization, what we see today as complex segments arranged 
along the anterior posterior axis happened gradually. So the segmental organization was attained gradually throughout early stages of um, arthropod evolution, uh, exactly how this happened and how we know, um, I'll explain in a few minutes. So hypothesis A is gradual attainment of segmental organization. Segmentation did not appear all at once. It's not a single character, but a complex character made up of several sub-characters which appeared slowly and gradually. Hypothesis B has to do with the developmental basis of tegmatization. So the organization of the arthropod body plan, or in this case, the insect body plan into head, thorax, and abdomen has a very early developmental basis, which I suggest, or my colleagues and I suggest, has been mostly overlooked by people working on arthropod development. And I'll try to convince you that tegmatization actually develops or appears in the developmental process much earlier um, than most people have considered up to now. The third hypothesis has to do with the arthropod head or specifically the anterior part of the arthropod head, the region known as the procephalon. And I will argue that um, this part of the head, the anterior head has a very ancient origin. And I'll try to convince you using both Evo Devo data and fossil data that these anterior most segments of the arthropod head um, are distinct and separate from all other uh, from all other segments and have a distinct evolutionary history. Okay, so um, somebody's knocking on my door, but I'll ignore that. So I'll start with hypothesis A. Um, as I said, what I'm trying to suggest here is that segmental organization did not appear all at once, but appeared slowly. And I want to present a model for how this may have evolved and then talk a bit about how we can test this model or look for data that will support this model. So the model starts with an ancient Precambrian early bilateral organism. So this is an organism that has a clear anterior part and a posterior part, um, and it's unsegmented. It does not, it's not differentiated into specific regions. It doesn't have repeating body units. It's something similar to what we find in flatworms today. Throughout evolution, there is selection towards elongation of the body, and we see this happening numerous times in numerous different phyla. So animals tend to evolve into worms. So a worm is a general term that means a long animal that doesn't have clear appendages. We see worms evolving in numerous different taxa. There are several reasons why being a worm is a good thing. It helps in movement. It helps, um, it helps to dig into the ground. Uh, it helps moving underground. Uh, Etc. So evolving into a worm shape is something that probably happened several times in several different phyla. Once an animal is a worm, once it's long, then there's a selective advantage to subdivision of various body systems into repeating units along this axis. So these are very hypothetical um, body systems. They're not, they're not meant to represent anything specific, but just for the sake of, of discussion, we can say that, say these red rectangles are maybe ganglia and these blue things may be bits of muscle. They may be bits of, of nephridia, the excretory system. And then we can see that the body is also divided into repeated or subdivided into repeated external units that may be aid in movement. So we have this proto-segmentation or what we call metamerization where several different body systems are repeated along the anterior posterior axis, but we don't have this integration into true segments. The next evolutionary step is the integration into segments where the different body units become synchronized because there's an advantage to the regulation of different systems being regional and being integrated, um, regulated and integrated in different domains. So we will have these external division synchronized with these ganglia, synchronized with these muscles or whatever they are. So here we have really the first appearance of what we can call segmentation. But what really defines and characterizes true segmentation, so true segmentation of the type we find in arthropods, is the way segmentation develops throughout embryonic development. And the development of segmentation usually involves the gradual formation of a undifferentiated repeated unit, a proto-segment, a nascent segment, which is made up of mostly uniform undifferentiated cells. And these cells gradually differentiate to give rise to different body units, to different to system, to 
elements of different body systems. So this early undifferentiated unit will then differentiate to give rise to muscles, and then will differentiate to give rise to ganglia, and then to exoskeleton, et cetera. So really one of the defining features of true segmentation, the process of segmentation, is that segments appear as an undifferentiated unit and then differentiate. What's the alternative? So what other way could this in theory be done in development? We could have a proto-nervous system, which develops as a nervous system and is then divided into repeated, into a distinct repeated ganglia. But that's not what happens. We don't have the nervous system developing separately from the muscle system. We have a proto-segment, which will develop elements of both the nervous system and the muscle system and the skeletal system. So this is something that we find in all cases of segmentation. And in the model we present here, this is the final evolutionary stage, the integration of all the different repeated elements into a single segment that's into, sorry, not single segments, but into repeated segments that are both differentiated morphologically in the adult and are differentiated early embryologically. So this is um, the model we want to present. Why is this model significant? For much of um, the early current century, for the early for the early 21st century, the early 2000s, there was a raging debate in Evo Devo and evolution about the origin of segmentation. So if we look at where we find segmented body plans, we find them in several different phyla. So we find them in the arthropods, of course, as I've mentioned. We find partial segmentation, not true segmentation in the onychophorans, which are a sister group to arthropods. We also find segmentation, as Martin mentioned, in chordates and invertebrates. And we find segmentation in annelids, Eduardo's favorite group. And each one of these segmented phyla is in a different branch of the animal tree. So annelids belong to the Lophotrochozoans, um, Arthropods belong to the ecdysozoans and vertebrates belong to the deuterostomes. And as I said, for much of the early 21st century, there was a raging debate about whether segmentation is homologous. So did segmentation evolve once in an early ancestor, early on in the evolution of bilaterians, and then was probably lost in a few phyla? Or did it evolve independently, convergently in each one of these evolutionary branches? I think that it's pretty much solved. I think there are very few people who still believe um, that there's a common origin to segmentation. It's fairly clear based on um, various sources of data that segmentation evolved independently in each one of these branches. And really the hypothesis, the model that I presented in the previous slide is an attempt to explain how this could have happened. So what is the evolutionary advantage of each one of the steps in the process leading from the leading from an early simple bilaterian to a segmented complex organism such as an annelid or an arthropod or a chordate. Now, if we can actually show that, if we can find evidence of each one of these intermediate stages, we can strongly support our idea that at least in arthropods, because that's our focal, our focal group, at least in arthropods, segmentation evolved gradually. And if segmentation evolved gradually in arthropods, then quite clearly it could not have evolved in a common ancestor of arthropods and other groups, because then we would have to find a segmented ancestor to all other groups. So, so this is really part of the same debate, which, as I said, is pretty much solved in the last five years. I think most people accept that segmentation evolved convergently, um, but um, the, the debate, at least in some parts, continues. Um, so why do I have the slide again? Because I was supposed to explain it here. So what I'm going to do, um, no, wait, one more thing. If we actually look at the fossil record of arthropods, so this is um, a, an expansion of part of the tree that I showed you earlier, or a slightly different version, do we indeed see gradual attainment of segmental characters as we move up the tree from the stem group arthropods or the arthropod sister groups um, to um, true arthropods um, living today, marked here in blue? Probably, but we still need more data. If we look at something like the radiodontids group that I'll mention uh, in more detail uh, later on in the talk, we see that they have repeated units, they have an annulated body, they have repeated flaps, 
but they don't seem to have true segmentation. So the, the trunk itself, the body itself is not divided into clear segments. Uh, and from the evidence we have, we don't have this synchronization. We don't have this, um, this clear alignment of different units, different body units in single segments. So I would argue that radiodontids, uh, fossil sister group to arthropods, as well as tardigrades and onychophorans, which are living sister groups to arthropods, do not have true segmentation. They have something uh, that I would say is equivalent to either this stage or this stage. So stage C or D in our model of segmentation. So not full segmentation. And again, if this is true, if we move further out uh, on the tree, we would expect to find animals that are completely unsegmented or have very early um, stages of, of repeat of body units. And in fact, a week ago, a new fossil from China was published, which I didn't even have a chance to stick into my talk, which is supposed to be a sister group somewhere out here. So it's actually a sister group to not only to arthropods, but to arthropods plus other ectisozoans. And it looks pretty much as I would expect something to look here. So it's somewhere in the transition between B and C. So this fossil really fits well with our model, but I think the people who published this fossil didn't have the specific question in mind, so they didn't look at it specifically, but I would say that as more fossils are found, really this, this hypothesis is supported more and more. Another approach, so in addition to looking at the fossil record and trying to find these intermediate stages is going back to Evo Devo to try and understand in greater detail how individual segments develop, how they develop in different arthropod groups and to try and find evidence of this complex proto-segment, nascent segment and try and understand exactly what's happening there. And through that, try and reconstruct the evolution of the developmental process that generates the complex segments. So again, I'm taking this, taking this model focusing on this stage over here, trying to get a better understanding through Evo Devo, through developmental biology of extant arthropods and try and understand better what's happening here and through that to try and reconstruct what happened in the earlier stages. So this is very much work in process and I can tell you that this section of the talk, I'll give you a lot of data, but there will not be a conclusion at the end because we still, there are a lot of things we still don't know, but I want to spend maybe the next 15 or 20 minutes focusing on what we know about the process of segmentation and how individual segments have formed, how that has evolved, how that has changed, uh, and what evidence can give us about the early evolution of segmentation. Maybe this is a good time to take another three minute break and see if there are any questions. And I noticed uh, that in the previous, there was an other question, that in the previous tree of arthropod and pre-arthropod evolution, I missed the trilobites. Ah, uh, yes, trilobites. There's actually a debate about where the trilobites fit. They are you arthropods, or they're crown group arthropods, they're within arthropods, um, true arthropods. There's a debate whether they're closer to the mandibulate branch or to the chelicerate branch. There's more and more evidence that they're closer to the mandibulate branch, but exciting and beautiful as, as trilobites are, they actually have all of the characters of modern arthropods. So if you want to understand the evolution of arthropod characters, they're not that interesting because they already have it all. They're not an intermediate step. Um, so I love trilobites, but they're a different story. Okay, thanks. Um, how am I doing? Am I going too fast? Are, are people following? About halfway through. This is a good time to see if I still have everyone. Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go back to the process of segmentation, the process of how segments are generated throughout development. In the last few years, it's become common to divide the segmentation process into two types or two different ways of creating segments. There's what has been called long germ, segment, long germ segmentation in which all segments appear simultaneously. This is what we find in Drosophila. This is the, a different representation of the same cascade I showed you in one of the first slides. 
early maternal determinants, gap genes, peril genes, and then segment polarity genes. And in parallel, a group of genes known as homeotic genes or Hox genes, which I know that Armin talked about a bit. Um, so the segment polarity genes define the boundaries of the segments and the homeotic genes define the identity of the segments. Now, in reality, this isn't really a simple cascade. This leads to this, this leads to this, but it's actually a very complex gene regulatory network with both activation shown here with arrows and repression shown with these blunt lines. So this combination of activation and repression, which actually jumps between levels, genes from the maternal stage are involved in the gap gene stage and involved later and there's feedback between stages. It's a very complex network. Uh, and as I said, we understand it fairly well in Drosophila. But what has become fairly clear in the past 20 years is that Drosophila is actually fairly unusual. And the simultaneous mode of segmentation, this beautiful hierarchy of one of, of dividing the body into smaller and smaller units is actually fairly unusual and is not found in most arthropods. It's evolved fairly recently, possibly even convergently, specifically in a subset of holometabolous insects. So there's only some insects which show this mode of segmentation. And specifically the characteristics that we know from Drosophila are found only in Drosophila and a few closely related flies. So even though the segmentation cascade is beautiful. We've learned a lot from it about how developmental genetics works. It's probably not typical for arthropods. And most arthropods use a different mode of segmentation, which is usually referred to as short-term segmentation. And in short-term segmentation, most segments appear sequentially from a growth zone. So there's a posterior domain, which we call the growth zone or the segment addition zone, which is shown here in red. And there's some kind of repeating process, which here is, is indicated by this sort of sine wave to tell us that it's a cycling process. And this cycling process generates segments one at a time. So there's this posterior domain and this posterior domain undergoes a complex developmental process that repeats itself again and again. And every time it repeats itself, every time the clock ticks, if you will, it generates a new segment. So again, very different simultaneous segmentation, all the segments appear at once. The entire embryo is divided into segments in one go. That's why it's called long germ because it's a long process. The entire embryo undergoes it as opposed to short germ where development happens only in a small part of the embryo and segmentation appears sequentially. It's fairly clear that short germ segmentation is the ancestral mode of segmentation. It's what we find in most arthropods um, it's most conserved. And as I said, long germ segmentation evolved convergently fairly late in arthropod evolution and only in a few specific groups. Now, like every dichotomy in biology, this is of course also a false dichotomy because many insects actually use a little bit of both. So they generate anterior segments uh, in the blastoderm simultaneously in a process similar to what we see in long-term development. And they generate posterior segments sequentially later in development in a process very similar to what we see in short-term development. And we can see this, for example, in this animal, the milkweed bug on Copeltis, which shows exactly what I said. There, it has an early stage known as the blastoderm stage. So the blastoderm stage is an early stage where the Embryo is a massive yolk surrounded by a single layer of cells. So this layer of cells is known as the blastoderm, very similar to what we see in Drosophila. During the blastoderm stage, we have the molecular determination of the first, in this case, six segments. So six segments are determined molecularly early on. We then have a complex process of invagination, which I won't go into. We get a structure known as the germ band, and in the posterior of the germ band, there's a growth zone or segment addition zone that acts to add segments one at a time sequentially. So we have in the same species, two modes of segmentation, early simultaneous, late sequential. And this animal, Acapelsus fasciatus, partially because of, of this characteristic and also because of several other characteristics has become the main research model in my lab for the past 
13 years. We've moved to a few other species since then, but for many years, most of the work and most of the data I'll show you um, in this part of the talk will be data from Oncopeltus fasciatus. Why is Oncopeltus such a good model? First of all, they're incredibly cute, um, beautiful little animals. They're hemimetabolous insects, which means that what hatches from the egg is a small version of the adult that doesn't have wings, is not sexually mature, does not have sexual organs, but has legs, a head, antennae. This is in contrast with the Drosophila. Drosophila is a holometabolous insect, and what hatches from the egg, the end process of embryonic development, is a maggot. The maggot doesn't have legs, it doesn't have a head, it doesn't have wings. In fact, it's missing most of the nervous system. So if we want to understand the evolution of anything in the adult body plan, using Drosophila leaves us with many holes because Drosophila development does not generate a fly. It generates a very simple maggot. So as a hemimetabolous insect, it gives us a lot more information. It is super easy to maintain. It's probably the easiest lab animal I've ever come across. They drink water and eat sunflower seeds and they lay eggs all the time. And of course, as an embryologist, what you want is an animal that's easy to keep and lays eggs all the time. So Oncopeltis is perfect for this. The eggs are just under a millimeter long, so much bigger than Drosophila eggs, easy to work with. We can stain for RNA using RNA and C hybridization. We can knock down genes using RNA interference. We have a sequenced genome. We have CRISPR working, not perfectly, but it's on the way to working. And we have many other techniques. So this is a very convenient lab animal. In terms of phylogeny, uh, so if, if this is a simplified phylogeny of insects, most insects belong to the group known as holometabola. These are the insects that have full metamorphosis. They include, for example, Drosophila. They include beetles, um, the beetle tribolium, and of course, all the beautiful beetles that Armin works on and, and uh, Eduardo has worked on are in this group, Coleoptera. But all of these together belong to the holometabolous insect. This is a fairly modern group. It's super diverse, but in terms of development and body plan, it's very specialized. It's actually developed or evolved all kinds of very specific characteristics that are not found in any other, in any other arthropods. And therefore, if you want to understand early evolution of arthropods, working on holometabolous insects can actually be a bit confusing. Oncopheltus, our favorite animal, is a member of the group known as Paraneoptera, which includes the hemiptera, the true bugs. Paraneoptera are the sister group to holometabolous insects. So first of all, if we're interested in holometabolous insects, it's always useful to have a close sister group. So they're the closest outgroup, the closest sister group to this huge diversity. They're much more conservative. So a lot of the specializations that we find in holometabolous insects are not found in Oncopeltis. Uh, so they're, they're a good sister group and they sort of straddle the transition between the early say more primitively developing um, basal insects and holometabolous insects. So both phylogenetically in terms of convenience, in terms of ease of rearing, Oncopeltis is a beautiful lab model. Quick overview of how Oncopeltis develops. So I've, I've already said this, but I'll repeat it again. There's an early stage, which we call the blastoderm stage, which is the mass of yolk, the egg, which is covered by a thin layer of cells. And during the blastoderm cell, we have the formation of six body segments. These are the segments of the mouth part, mandibular, maxillary, and labial segments, and the segments of the thorax, T1, T2, and T3. The posterior most part of the blastoderm invaginates into the egg. It sort of does this complex somersault and all the tissue moves into the yolk. And a bit later, we have the germ band stage where we have the complex head, the thorax, and all the abdominal segments, which all form from the growth zone or segment addition zone. Um, from egg laying to adult is about one month or about five weeks, actually, um, all included. And a month after an egg is laid, we have an adult that starts reproducing. So also a relatively short um, relatively short life cycle, not as short as Drosophila, but shorter than many other animals. I want to, I'll, I'll tell you a few minor stories or a few mini stories, not minor, a few mini stories from our work over the last 10, 12 years on different aspects of segmentation. There'll be sort of little vignettes 
of work on segmentation. And then I'll try and tie it all together at the end. One of the first projects that we worked on when I first set up my lab was looking at this specific section of the network um, marked here by this um, gray line, this gray ellipse. This is what's known as the gap gene network. So the four gap genes in Drosophila, I remind you, this is the second level of the segmentation cascade. These are four genes that interact. And if you knock one of them down, you have a gap, you have a missing group of segments. They're known as Hunchback or HB, Krupal, KR, Knurps, KNI, and Giant, GT. The names come from the phenotypes that you get in the larva if you knock down these genes. Um, Krupal and Knurps are both German words for seriously messed up. Hunchback means seriously messed up. And giant means, for some reason or other, these larvae are actually bigger than normal. So we, one of the first things I did in my independent lab was to look, look for these genes in Oncopeltis. And as I told you, most of these developmental genes are conserved. These are all transcription factors, all four of these in co-transcription factors. They're conserved. We can find actually orthologs of some of these genes, even in the human genome doing completely different things, but I wanted to find the orthologs of these genes in Oncopeltis and see what they're doing. And if you look at the expression of these genes, um, you can see that they're expressed broadly in domains that are very similar to their expression domains in Drosophila. So um, if we look at Hunchback, Hunchback is expressed in a broad domain if we identify which specific segments is expressed in, these are the same segments that is expressed in, in Drosophila. But keep in mind that in Drosophila, you have all 15 segments in the blastoderm, whereas in Oncopeltis, you only have the six anterior segments in the blastoderm. So if you look at the six anterior segments of Drosophila and see where the gap genes are expressed in those specific segments, they're expressed in similar domains in Oncopeltis. So we have a conservation of expression domains of a group of transcription factors that are involved in a very early stage in the differentiation of the blastoderm. This is true for hunchback, Krupal, and giant, but actually Knurps is different. So the fourth gap gene, Knurps, is expressed in a stripe that's nothing like um, the expression domain in Drosophila. And in a separate project, we were actually able to show that Knurps is a novelty, is a new gene. In fact, it's a duplication of an ancient gene that was recruited to the gap gene network only in Drosophila and a group of related flies. So Knurps is actually not an ancient gap gene, but these four genes, at least in terms of expression domain, probably are ancient gap genes. So they have a conserved role. If we look at the interactions between them, and I didn't put that slide up here, but if we try and reconstruct the network the interactions between the different gap genes, we find that it's very different from the network in Drosophila. So orthologous genes expressed in similar domains, but interacting in a different way. This is interesting, um, but I'll leave that open for now. If we take each one of these gap genes and try and understand its function. So what happens if you knock down a gap gene? So we knock down each one of these gap genes, giant, Krupal, and hunchback using RNA interference and then looked at a series of other genes that are expressed in every segment. So genes that are supposed to give us stripes in every segment. And what we find is if we knock down giant, we lose the expression domains of two specific segments. So marked here in these little asterisks are the places where we would expect in a wild type, in a normal blastoderm, to find an expression stripe of these four genes. We don't find those stripes. In Krupal, if we knock down Krupal, we're missing two segments, different segments, not the same segments from, um, uh, from Giant. Hunchback is actually interesting. We don't lose any segments, but we have a shift in segment identity. So segments that are supposed to be abdominal segments look like thoracic segments. So we have a, a almost homeotic shift in segment identity. What this tells us is that the gap genes or the the role of gap genes in the blastoderm is conserved even in Oncopeltis, which is very different, very distant from Drosophila. Even in this animal that does not have real short term, real long term development, in the early simultaneous segmentation phase that's similar to the segmentation phase to the entire segmentation in Drosophila, we have a very conserved process. So basically, we can say 
in a single summary statement that simultaneous segmentation in the oncopeltis blastoderm is very similar to the simultaneous segmentation we see in the entire blastoderm in all of the segments of the long-term drosophila. Moving to the second phase of segmentation, so the segmentation, um, the sequential segmentation from the growth zone, we looked at a series of genes that are known from the segmentation process in Drosophila. Again, we find the orthologs of these genes. We look at their expression using RNA and C2 hybridization, and we see, not surprisingly, stripes. So the stripe expression means that this gene is active in specific domains um, in a repeating process. And remember the repeating process of sequential segmentation. All of these genes, even skipped, odd skipped, runs, sister of Odskip and Bowl, odd paired, sloppy paired, hairy, et cetera, the names are not important. All of these are genes that are pair rule genes in Drosophila. So genes that in Drosophila are expressed in every other segment. If we look at their expression in the Oncopeltis germ band, in the growth zone, the segment addition zone, we find that they're expressed in every single segment. So we have a single segment periodicity as opposed to the double segment periodicity we find in Drosophila. Segments are not generated two at a time and then divided in half as they are in Drosophila, but they're generated one at a time, but using the same genes. So the same genes that are involved in generating two segments at a time, the payroll pattern, the, two, the even or odd segment stripes that we see in Drosophila, the same genes are giving us a stripe every single segment. We can also try and look at the expression of two genes together, so do what is known as a double in C2. These are very difficult experiments to do. They very rarely come out really pretty, uh, but still they're good enough to show um, the relative expression of different genes. So we looked at all of these genes and we did various combinations of two genes together to try and see the relative expression, which gene overlaps, which gene is anterior posterior. And this allows us to, to give this entire summary of the relative expression of a series of segmentation genes in Oncopeltis. I want to make an important point here. This is a schematic picture of the posterior of the Oncopeltis germ band embryo. This is the posterior growth zone. This is the anterior growth zone. This is the most recently developed segment. So the youngest segment in the embryo, and this is segment N minus one or the next youngest segment. If we look at the germ band, of a single embryo, we're actually looking at a time series because genes that are expressed uh, in this segment are expressed early in this segmentation process. Genes that are expressed in this segment, which is a slightly older segment, are expressed later in the segmentation process. And this is also true for the anterior part of the growth zone. So as we look at the relative expression of these different genes in the anterior growth zone, and in the nascent segments, we can actually say something about the sequence in which they act. So we can say that this gene is the earliest acting, this one is a bit later, this one comes on later, then this one, then this one, et cetera. So we can actually look at a sequence of activation of different genes. But the interesting point is also that all of these genes that are expressed in stripes are only expressed in the anterior part of the growth zone. The posterior part of the growth zone express a, all of the genes that are expressed in the posterior part of the growth zone, or almost all of the genes, are expressed in a solid, stable domain. So not in the dynamic stripes we see in the anterior growth zone and in the segmented part of the embryo, but solid domain. So this is a, an, a region that's stable developmentally. It's expressing the same genes in a uniform expression all the time. If we... Sorry, if we look at the sequence of activation of these genes and the interactions between them, we find that the sequence is very similar to the sequence we see in Drosophila. So if you remember from one of the first slides, I talked about primary parallel genes and secondary parallel genes and segment polarity genes. The sequence in Oncopeltis goes primary parallel genes, secondary parallel genes, segment polarity genes. So even though the segmentation process is very different, it occurs in a different cellular environment. The dynamics are different. The sequence or the, the rate of formation of segments is different. We still see the same conserved network of interactions. So the same cascade of 
these genes activate these genes, activate these genes. This is conserved regardless of the specifics of the segmentation process. This allows us to reconstruct what the segmentation process in an ancestral insect, if we look at other arthropods, we can go to an ancestral arthropod even and see how this process took place um, very early in, in arthropod evolution. Another question that we wanted to add to this, what's happening at the cellular level? So up to now, we've only looked at gene expression patterns, but if we also look at individual cells, so what we have here is a growth zone. We've stained it um, using DAPI to show us individual nuclei, individual cells, and we've stained it using um, an antibody to phosphorylated histone three. This is an antibody that binds to cells that are actively in the process of cell division that are undergoing mitosis. So every place where you see a cell marked in green, this is a cell that's actively dividing. And if we look at many embryos of different stages, we see something that repeats itself. We see that the growth zone is divided into two domains. This is actually very similar to the two domains that I mentioned here, the anterior and posterior growth zone. So the growth zone is divided into a posterior domain that has fairly abundant cell division profiles and an anterior growth zone, which has significantly reduced cell division profiles. We want to map gene expression patterns on the cell division patterns. And as a warning, these experiments are very difficult to do. The images are not very sharp. There's a lot of background, but still we can show that this distinction between posterior, posterior growth zone with cell division is the same posterior growth zone where we see solid expression of genes such as caudal and even skip. And the anterior growth zone where we have reduced levels of cell division is the same domain where we see the striped expression, where we see the dynamic process that's generating the segments themselves. As we move into the segmented growth zone itself, so this is invected, one of the segment polarity genes. So where we see the expression of invected itself, we already have defined segments. The way we interpret this is that the posterior growth zone is a dom domain where there's cell proliferation, where new tissue is being generated to feed the segmentation machinery. As cells move into the anterior growth zone, they stop dividing because they're undergoing differentiation. Usually cells that are differentiating do not divide at the same time. So the cells here are undergoing differentiation are expressing a dynamic mode of several different genes that are interacting in sequence, in this sequence that I showed you here. As they move anteriorly, or actually as um, the growth zone moves posteriorly, leaving behind differentiated segments that then start cell division again. And in a later process, which is, this is the process that I find very interesting, but we haven't really worked on yet, in the later process here and here, we start seeing the differentiation of these undifferentiated early segments into all of the different tissues I mentioned before, nervous tissue, muscles, exoskeleton, etc. If we look at the germ band and the segment addition zone in other arthropods, so this is an insect, this is Oncopeltis, this is a centipede, this is from work I did during my postdoc, um, this is a uh, spider, um, this is from work from Vim Daman's lab uh, and from, I think, Alistair McGregor's lab. So several people who've worked on segmentation in spiders. Many of the things that we've seen and characterized in detail in Oncopeltis can also be seen in other arthropods. So the model that we can suggest for arthropod segmentation, even though it was built using Oncopeltis, is probably at least most of the aspects of this model are probably general for arthropods. Uh, and probably ancestral. So they can tell us something about how segments were generated in ancestral arthropod. And this model, again, I'm summarizing everything I showed before, tells us that there's a posterior part of the growth zone, which undergoes cell, cell, differenti sorry, cell division and very little differentiation. And there's an anterior part of the growth zone where there is reduced cell division in a dynamic process of segmentation. And then as this whole domain moves back, leaving behind it um, the segmented germ band, we see cell division happening again and we see differentiation happening again. We can also map different modes of segmentation. Maybe the slide should have been a bit earlier, but we were also able to map 
different modes of segmentation, sequential segmentation, mixed segmentation, growth zone segmentation, et cetera, uh, on a tree of insects. And I won't go into too many details here, but what we were able to show in a paper from four or five years ago is that actually within insects, there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of plasticity and many processes such as simultaneous segmentation shown with this icon here, probably evolved convergently in several different lineages within insects. Whereas in the beetles specifically, which are the best studied example of sequential segmentation, they probably lost the anterior blastoderm segmentation that we find ancestrally in the sister group, uh, such as Oncopeltis. So this is a complex process and we can look at different species to, to map um, how this has changed throughout evolution of insects. Questions up to now on this part before I move to the next hypotheses. I, I oh. have one. Yes. Uh, and I think I may also had one. So my question is, do you, that uh, uh, seems like you have growth zone divided in a, in a you know, stem cell that's posterior and, and then a post, you know, post divisional uh, area where some initial uh, rounds of cell fate uh, specification take place. Right. Is that, do you see stem cell markers? Have you looked for those? No, we haven't actually. Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, we've never specifically looked for stem cells. Um, if you have some ideas for stem cell markers that we could look at, that's something that I'd probably be interested in pursuing to see whether, I mean, it, it actually ties in the, with the question of how much differentiation takes place in early segmentation, how much takes place in later segmentation. So this is, this is a direction that I would definitely be interested in going into, but we haven't done yet. Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, there's a bunch of uh, what you call the primordial stem cell germline uh, lineage yeah. that you see in many other uh, invertebrates like kiwi, vasa, nanos. There's also win trees associated with that. So, so Peewee and, and so, so all of these, actually people have looked at them in arthropods. They're specifically related to germ cells and not to, um, not to stem cells. Uh, so there isn't specific expression of any of these genes in the posterior growth zone. But maybe we can follow this up in a later discussion, um, just mm -hmm. the two of us. Okay, so I want to move to this second hypothesis, the question of the, the developmental basis of tegmatization. This is actually a few different sub questions. This will be a relatively brief section because this is just, this is a subject we've just started working on and have some preliminary data uh, and we'll hopefully be following up in the next few years. So if you ask most developmental biologists, how are the differences between domains, between different, between segments. How are the differences between segments determined at the molecular level? They will say Hox genes. Hox genes are generally accepted to be the genes that are responsible for segmental identity. And for close to 100 years, people have been mutating or knocking down or finding natural mutants of Hox genes, homeotic genes, and seeing that what knocking down or mutating a Hox gene usually does, it causes segments to change identity to undergo homeotic transformation from one type of segment to a different type of segment. And the, the logical conclusion for this is that the difference between the head and the thorax and the thorax and the abdomen would probably have to do with differences in Hox gene expression. But if you actually look at the map of Hox gene expression in different arthropod groups, and this is from a beautiful review paper, and I apologize that the color here is wrong. There's a beautiful review paper from almost 20 years ago that summarized everything that was known about Hox gene expression at the time, and we know a bit more now. The borders of the Hox genes usually don't overlap with the borders of the tegmata. They're not where we would expect them to be. So in some cases they are, but we don't find a perfect correlation between tagma borders and Hox gene expression borders. And the paradigm for Hox gene usually says that the important border is the anterior border. So actually the anterior border of the Hox gene is what's determining the identity of a segment and not the posterior border. So in chelicerates, we have the posterior border of several gap genes of several Hox genes in the border between the opistosoma and the, sorry, between the prosoma 
and the opistosoma, but we don't see any anterior borders, which is what we, do, we would expect to see. In insects, none of the Hox genes perfectly correspond with borders between tagmata. Just as an example, this is abdominal A, uh, which is expressed in the abdomen. It's anterior border of expression is actually not the border between the abdomen and the thorax, but half a segment posterior to that. So abdominal A is probably not the gene that's responsible for the difference between thorax and abdomen. If you look at an embryo, so this is a late stage Oncopeltis embryo, the thoracic segments and the abdominal segments are actually very different in shape. And this difference in shape arises before Hox genes are expressed. So there is reason to suspect that the paradigm that Hox genes are responsible for tagmatal borders is probably incorrect. If we look at the segmentation process in Oncopeltis, which I've already talked about at length, and look at, for example, the gene even skip. So this is a very important gene in segmentation and development. It's involved in the segmentation process at several different points, at several different um, sub-processes. Its early expression uh, is in two thirds of the embryo. It's defining the posterior. It's defining actually what will be the embryonic region. It's then expressed in stripes, um, segmental stripes during the blastoderm. And these stripes appear simultaneously. So it has a role in the simultaneous segmentation in the blastoderm. And it's then expressed in stripes in the growth zone, in the anterior growth zone and in the posterior most segmented um, germ band. So this is a gene that has different roles in different phases of segmentation and it's expressed differently. The same gene is expressed dynamically in a different mode in simultaneous segmentation and sequential segmentation. But if we actually look at the identity of the segments where this gene is expressed, and I actually said this already. I said this, but I didn't say it clearly. Even skipped is involved in simultaneous segmentation in the thorax and in the nasal segments, so the three segments of the mouth parts. And it's involved in sequential segmentation in the abdominal segments. So actually the distinction between thorax and abdomen is very early on in how the segments are generated, the dynamics of segment generation. Thoracic segments and nasal segments are generated simultaneously in the blastoderm and, and abdominal segments are generated sequentially in the growth zone. Now we know that this is not the case in Drosophila. We actually also know that this is not the case in Tribolium. So you can argue, okay, that's Oncopeltis. Oncopeltis has two different modes of segmentation and by coincidence, the transition between simultaneous segmentation and sequential segmentation happens to happen between the thorax and the abdomen, but that's meaningless from an evolutionary or developmental point of view. So we decided to look at other species. First, we look through the, sorry, one more point. The head region um, segments in a completely different mode known as splitting, and I'll come back to that um, towards the end of the talk. Okay. So first we started looking at the literature and we looked, for example, at a paper describing segmentation in Grillis, the cricket. And what we saw, something that the authors don't actually point out is that we see the nasal and the thoracic segments appearing rapidly, not simultaneously, but appearing very rapidly. And then there's a break of about six hours. So all these segments appear over about an hour, an hour and a half. Then there's a six hour break and the first abdominal segment comes up. So even though it's not a strong distinction as we see in Oncopeltis, the blastoderm versus the germ band, we still see a gap, a shift in segmentation mode between thoracic or nasal segmentation and mandibular segmentation. And we see here as well that the shape of the thoracic segments is very different from the abdominal segments. We started looking at an additional model species in our own lab. This is the German cockroach, Platella which has beautiful embryos. So cockroaches um, develop their embryos in an egg case. The female carries this egg case. And if you look carefully, you can see that the egg case is divided into these slices. Each one of these slices, if you peel off um, the outer cuticle, is a single embryo that looks sort of like a lemon slice. Or uh, um, I don't know if, you, if they're called this in, in Argentina as well. Um, yeah, now I've forgotten the word. Um, anyway, there's a type of sweets 
that look sort of like lemon sweet, like, like slices of lemon or orange and have about this shape. So that's what the Blatella embryos look like. This is from a paper from the 1970s, from Tanaka 1976, describing the development of Blatella. We're specifically interested in these very early stages where segments develop. And the student in the lab has developed a method to collect and stain these embryos. We can now look at the dynamics of segmentation. This is the germ band as it appears on the yolk, on the mass of yolk. This is after Aurel dissected it, placed it on a microscope slide. And it looks like the dynamics are similar to the dynamics in Gryllis. So we have the nasal segments and the thoracic segments appearing not simultaneously, but very rapidly. And then there's a break before the next few segments, the abdominal segments appear. So we're suggesting again, a hypothesis, a model which we still have to test, which is a two-phase model for tegmatization. So for the, there's a T missing here, sorry. Uh, so a two-phase model of the formation of, of the differentiation of tegmata. Phase one is this distinct and temporally separate segmentation mechanisms. So the anterior segments, the nasothoracic segments, the segments of the mouth parts and the thorax develop through one mode and the abdominal segments develop through a different mode. That mode doesn't have to be simultaneous sequential blastoderm germ band as we see in Oncopeltis. It can be various variations of this, but still two separate mechanisms for anterior segmentation and posterior segmentation. Phase two is the elaboration of tagma specific structures. So the specifics that identify and define each segment, the differences between nasal segments and thoracic segments and abdominal segments is through the activity of various regional modifiers, which are mostly Hox genes. So what we're saying is that Hox genes are not telling the segment to be abdominal or thoracic. It's a early phase that's telling the segment to be abdominal or thoracic and a later phase Hoxian phase that's telling a segment, okay, you're an abdominal segment, this is what you have to do. These are the structures that you have to develop. And this is um, an open project which we're starting or expect to do over the next few years. From an evolutionary point of view, this is probably true for hemimetabolous insects and was probably lost in holometabolous insects, which is why nobody's ever noticed it before because most work has been in holometabolous insects. So this is a, an interesting evolutionary developmental phenomenon, which has been completely missed by the community because nobody looked at the interesting non-model organisms. Questions about this section? How am I doing for time, Eduardo? Do I, do I have to rush or can I go through the last phase slowly? You're about uh, 80 minutes, Mark. Okay. Um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I, I had a question for, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if you're going to touch base on that, but is there anything known about how tagmata are determined in crustaceans, which have that you know, larger no. diversity? Of no, nobody's ever really looked at that. That's open field completely. Cool. Okay, so I think I will spend the last 10 minutes on the last hypothesis, which is actually the most exciting hypothesis and the one which really links fossil record with Evo Devo in the best way, which is why I've left it for the end. So there's been a debate about the evolution of the arthropod head for over 100 years. The debate is about the homology of specific segments in the arthropod head What's the connection between the prosoma, the cephalothorax of chelicerates and the head of myriapods and the head of crustaceans and the head of insects? Are they the same? Which segment is equivalent to which segment? What do we know about the different segments? How do they develop? This has been gradually solved over the past, again, the last 10 years. We have a solution which, like I said about phylogeny, it's dangerous to say we now know the answer but we have an answer that's supported by multiple lines of data and is fairly stable and will probably ultimately turn out to be the correct answer. What this answer says is that in all arthropods, there are three anterior most segments. And these anterior segments are the cholesterol segments in cholesterates, which is homologous with the antennal segments in myriapods and insects, uh, sorry, that was the second segment, what I just said. The first segment is the ocular segment, the segment that has the eyes and does not have any mouth parts. Uh, and that's homologous to the eyes 
in myriapods and the eyes and crustaceans. The second segment is the chelicera, which is homologous to the antenna, which is homologous to the first antenna in crustaceans. And the third segment is the pedipalps of chelicerate, which is homologous to the intercalary segment. This is a small segment that doesn't carry any appendages in insects and myriapods and the second antenna of crustaceans. So this is pretty much the emerging consensus. These three segments are different from all other segments in the fact that they have expanded ganglia and these ganglia, these three ganglia together make up the arthropod brain. So the arthropod brain is what is known as a tripartite brain, a brain that's made up of three segments. Each segment has a single ganglion and these ganglia are dorsal ganglia, whereas the segment, the ganglia in all other segments are ventral ganglia, so on the, on the ventral, on the lower side of the segment. So this is the, the consensus. What we wanted to ask is, okay, what can we say about the early evolution of these segments? Are these true segments? Are they similar to other segments? Did they evolve through the recruitment of trunk segments? So was there an ancient single segment head where segments were then added to it from the trunk or did this head then switch from a single segment to a three segment head? What, what exactly happened there? And the way to do this is to try and understand the development of these three segments. So let's give um, a bit of developmental background about the development of the head. Those of you who have been listening carefully may have noticed that there were a lot of things that I actually intentionally skipped. So when I talked about segmentation in Drosophila and when I talked about segmentation in Oncopeltis, I always talked about the nasal segments and the nasal segments, the segments of the mouth part and the thoracic segments, but I actually ignored the fact that, this, that the head is made up of six segments, not three segments. And the three anterior segments of the head are exactly these three prenatal segments. We'll call them from now on the PGS, the PGS, the prenatal segments, the segments that are anterior to the nasal segments, the mouth part segments. These segments are unusual. They're unusual because they form in this head lobe as opposed to in the clear germ band that we saw in numerous images. Hox genes are not expressed in the anterior two of these segments. They're only expressed in the third and the intercalary segment, the, the small segment that doesn't have appendages. Parallel genes are not expressed in these segments. They're only expressed in the nasal and thoracic and abdominal segments. They're not expressed in the prenatal segments of the procephalon. If we look at how segmental stripes develop in the prenatal segments, they're not simultaneous, they're not sequential, they develop in a process known as splitting, where there's a first single stripe, which then splits once and then twice to give three stripes that are equivalent to the three segmental stripes of the prenatal segments. Um, that's shown in this image here. So this is segments or stripe splitting in the gene hedgehog one of the segment polarity genes in a spider. This is work from uh, the Akiyama Oda lab. And in the centipede Stergamia, this is work from Michael Akam's lab from uh, Vera Hunnicol. And this is in Oncopeltis, work from our lab. This is actually even skipped, but we also showed it later in hedgehog in the same gene that we see here. So prenatal segments couldn't serve throughout arthropods, are formed through stripe splitting, a completely different process from the formation of any other segment. We then wanted to look at the gene regulatory network, the GRN involved in the segment polarity phase of segmentation, the last phase of segmentation. So the segment polarity network is made up of several genes. These are the genes engrailed uh, and also invected, which is not mentioned here, which are um, transcription factors and hedgehog and wingless, which are um, signaling molecules and cubitus interruptus, which is at CI, which is a complex, very large molecule, which has both signaling and transcription factor um, um, characteristics. The interactions between these four genes and, and a few other minor genes together form what is known as the segment polarity gene regulatory network. The segment polarity gene regulatory network is a super conserved network. All arthropods, all segments develop the final phase of segmentation, regardless of whether they're formed simultaneously or sequentially. All segments, the last phase of development is this segment polarity gene regulatory network, always, except for the prenatal segments. 
And what we did, a student, Oren Lev, um, over the past year and a half has been working specifically on the interactions between the segment polarity genes in Oncopeltis. And these genes are expressing the anterior part of the blastoderm. And I'm not going into all the details because I don't have enough time and because it's fairly complex. But what Owen has been able to show is that the expression pattern and the interactions between the segment polarity genes in the prenatal segments, in the three prosephalic segments, are completely different from this super conserved gene regulatory network. So we have a gene regulatory network that determines all of the segments in all of the arthropods, except for the anterior three segments. Now there's a recent, there's a recent idea in Evo Devo, which claims that structures that are, that develop using a conserved gene regulatory network are homologous structures even serially homologous structures. So all of the segments are serial homologs. They're formed throughout the same developmental gene regulatory network. If the gene regulatory network, if the interactions between the genes in two structures are different, we would say that those two structures are not homologous. If they're in the same organism, we would say they are not serially homologous. So what we are claiming, uh, our conclusion in this paper, is that the prenatal segments do not share this gene reg regulatory network, sometimes known as a character identitary, sometimes known as a character identitary identity network with trunk segments. So there's a fundamental difference in the molecular biology and in the interactions of the prenatal segments, in addition to everything we already saw. The fact that they are formed, they have a different shape, um, they are not the end of a cascade that involves parallel genes, hox genes are not involved. So prenatal segments are not serially homologous to other trunk segments. They're completely distinct structures. And I would even go as far as to say that the prenatal segments are not segments. Because they're not homologous, I, it's probably not correct to even use the same term. Now, what does this mean from an evolutionary point of view? So let's now shift to the fossil record and see what we can learn about fossil arthropods about the evolution of these prenatal segments. And this is just a pretty um, artist's impression of a group of Cambrian arthropods interacting uh, in the Cambrian ocean. This is Anomalocaris, um, this is Sydnia. Um, not sure what this one is. Uh, this is Opabinia, which we saw a fossil of early on. But I want to go back to this tree and remind you that I said early on that we can learn a lot about the evolution of the arthropod body plan by looking at this group of stem group arthropods. And I want to focus on three members of the stem group or three subgroups within the stem group. Um, I'll just say the names and remember them later. Kerygmakila is a fossil known from Sirius Passet in Greenland. Um, it's a very early stem group. It's what is known as a gilled lobopod. So it's, a, it's an animal that's not truly segmented. It does not have um, real segmented limbs, uh, and, but, but it has a sort of annulated body. Anomalocaris, which is a member of the group known as radiodontids. This is the super predator of the Cambrian. You've probably heard of it. It was an animal that was about you know, this big, about half a meter, whereas almost all other animals in the Cambrian were five centimeters or so. So this is um, a slightly higher stem group, slightly closer to true arthropods. And an animal known as Fushian Huya, which is a typical um, Cambrian arthropod found from um, in the Chengjiang deposits in China. It's named after Lake Fushian, uh, close to uh, these deposits, and is a slightly higher stem group or probably a very close sister group to modern arthropods, okay? So these are the three groups I'll talk about, Kerygmakila, Anomalocaris, and Fushian Hoya. So the, the radiodontids or dinocaridids, different names for the same group. This is Anomalocaris, which I already mentioned. It has partial segmentation. It has an annulated body. It does not have segmented limbs, except for these raptorial limbs, these hunting limbs in the anterior. It has eyes, and the eyes seem to come out of the same segment. So we have a head, that has these anterior appendages and has eyes. A few years ago, a fossil dinocaridid was found in China. The name of the species is Lyra rapax. And in this fossil, this is a astounding fossil because we have 
mineralized remains of the nervous system. So we can actually see color coded here, the remains of the brain. And this is the reconstruction of what this looks like. And if you look at the brain, if you look at the structure of the brain and compare it to what we know from arthropods today, you reach the conclusion that this animal had a single segment brain. So remember that arthropods today have a tripartite brain. It had a single segment brain and this single segment had on it both the eyes. So this would be the ocular segment, the anterior first segment of all arthropods today and these reptorial appendages we see here. So a single segment, a single anterior segment, a single head, which has a single ganglion and it has components that are equivalent to the anterior most segment of arthropods that exist today. Without showing the picture, I can tell you that there's a fossil of Kerygmakila, slightly lower stem group, which shows the same pattern, shows a single segment head. So early arthropod stem groups had a head that was made up of a single segment. Fushi and Hoya, the fossil from China. Also, we found several fossils that have the remains color-coded of the anterior nervous system. And careful analysis of the nervous system in these animals showed that they have a tripartite brain. So they have a brain that's made up of three ganglia, and they have a head that's made up of three segments, and they have, and the anterior most segment has an eye, and the second segment has this appendage, which looks sort of like an antenna. And then there's a third appendage, which is part of the brain that has this sort of mouth part like thing. So the head of Fushian Hoya, a very close relative in upper stem group arthropod, has a segment that is made, has a head that's made up of three segments. The model that we suggest, the hypothesis that we suggest based on combining data from the fossil record and from Evo Depot, is that the early arthropod stem group, Kerygmakila is the only one mentioned here, but this is true also for radiodontids, such as Lyra rapax and um, um, Anomalocaris, had a single segment head. And this single segment had both a raptoral appendage, a hunting appendage, a single ganglion, and the eyes. At some point in a group that we call Deuteropoda, this segment underwent some, some form of triplication. And as it underwent triplication, different, so it, it evolved into three segments and each one of these three segments adopted a part of the original single, single segment. The anterior most segment got the eyes, the second segment got the appendages, the third segment probably got a different appendage. And each one of these segments had a single ganglion. So the original single ganglion was split into three to give the three ganglia of the modern arthropod head. How do we support this? Basically by saying that these three segments are not homologous to the trunk segments, what we're saying is that there was an ancient segment which was formed through a gene regulatory network, which was initially the gene regulatory network of this segment only. As it underwent this triplication to give three segments, these three segments adopted the different gene regulatory network that is now typical to these segments only and is different from the gene regulatory network, which is equally ancient and is found only in the trunk segments. Okay, I've sort of reached the end, so I'll, I'll give a quick summary of the concepts I've talked about. So as I said, I'm interested as a general question in the evolution of the body plan. Most of my lab uses EvoDevo. So EvoDevo is comparative embryology, comparative developmental genetics, a lot of what I've talked about. We can analyze specific gene regulatory networks with the idea that every GRN is equivalent to a single homologous structure. We can look at how specific genes have changed their function throughout evolution. We can look at how families of genes have evolved throughout evolution. I have some projects on that, which I haven't mentioned here. We can use comparative morphology and try to link that with embryology to try and see how embryos or the how structures in adults evolve throughout the embryo. And we can add the fossil record and try and link the fossil record to morphology, to gene families, to specific gene regulatory networks. And all of these together give us different viewpoints, different sources of data into understanding the evolution of the arthropod body plan. And I like to use a metaphor here that the story of body plan evolution is a single story, but we have different languages telling us different parts of the story. 
And what we as evolutionary biologists have to do is to learn to speak all of these different languages so that we can piece together the stories told by different storytellers in different languages to understand the one story of animal body plan evolution. I'll end by thanking all of the people who made this possible. Obviously, I don't work alone. I have a lab. Um, this is a picture from about two years ago, and actually most of the people in this picture are no longer in the lab, but just to mention Saf Oman, who was involved in a lot of the um, growth zone segmentation work, uh, and uh, Asya Novikova, who was involved in a lot of the blastoderm work, uh, and several other members of the lab. This is what the lab looks like today. Um, we don't usually meet in person, and we meet through Zoom, even though people still come to the lab. Um, this is Oren, who did all of the head work. Um, this is Tamir, who's developing a lot of CRISPR protocols, which I didn't really talk about. Um, Ariel and Oel together uh, are working on um, developing Blatella, the cockroach as a new model system. Judy Wexler is a postdoc uh, who is both supervising Oren and Ariel on the cockroach work and working on the evolution of tegmatization and the evolution of the transition from holometabolous insects to hemimetabolous, sorry, from hemimetabolous insects to holometabolous insects. Nitsan is working on the evolution of the nervous system. Mira is my technician who keeps it all together. Shilat is an undergraduate student who's actually since left the lab, but was also working on blastoderm work. Collaborators, my fossil friends, Greg Edgecombe here, um, Doug Irwin uh, from the Smithsonian. I spent a sabbatical year there a few years ago where I learned how to look at arthropod fossils, funding, etc. Follow me on Twitter. Um, I mostly tweet about outreach stuff that I do, but also occasional lab updates and discussions. Um, and that's it. I'd be happy to take questions if there are any left, if we have time. Really nice talk, Ariel. Yes, what's, a, what's an amazing talk. Okay. Hi, Mer. Questions? Mm, thank you. Well, I, just very short to say that I'm not in my completely conditions. I, something really sad happened to all Latin America yesterday and to the whole, the, the whole world. No, yes. uh, Latin America, whole yes. world. Aware of this, yes. I, I was going to say something in the beginning, but maybe I'll, I'll maybe say now that, yes, I, I think that everybody in the world is, is uh, sharing what you're feeling today. But anyway, I love evolution. I, I feel it, I'm feeling right now, like in a, in a match, like, like, like Diego. So mm -hmm. it's hard, it's hard. You don't want to do it. You prefer to cry and lay in your bed but play it, play it. You you don't lose anything. You can play it. So, but I'm not in anthropology. I'm not entomologist. And I'm by informatics. And most of the talk, I don't understand it. But I understand about gene networks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, I have a question over that because the yes. networks that you show is extremely complex. Yes. But, yeah. So I wanted to ask you. Do you think the microevolution theory as the state of today is able to explain the origin and fixation of those huge, highly conserved gene, genes? How, how we can understand that with only natural selection, genetic drift? I'm not talking about intelligent design and any other things. Yeah. What I want to know is, do you think we really need an extension to understand so the phenomenon? This is actually a really interesting point. So first of all, microevolution can very clearly explain how networks evolve. So once you have a network, I think that most of, of the differences in networks are microevolution, changes in binding sites, changes in transcription factors. But how is a network assembled? So I can, I can give a few answers to that. There's a project that we did that I actually didn't show in this, in this talk where we looked at a specific network, a subnetwork of the Drosophila cascade. It's, it's known as the terminal patterning network. And we were able to show through this comparative approach of seeing what different genes are doing in different organisms, we were able to show how a network evolved from individual genes that were not originally connected. So how genes duplicated, changed their roles, used interactions that existed before to build a complex network that didn't exist before. And we can see this in a sequence uh, in the arthropod tree. So that's 
building a not very complex network, but building a novel network from pre-existing parts. Now, if you're asking how did the first networks evolve? So how did complex networks first come into being? That's, I think that's a deep question. Uh, I think that once you have regulation, once regulation exists, once, once the first transcription factors evolve, and we know that transcription factors exist in single cell animals, right? In, pro in single celled eukaryotes, we already have most of the transcription factors and they're involved in telling the cell to change states. So once you have the interaction between a transcription factor and DNA, the evolution of complex networks sort of comes out of that gradually. You have different domains, different regulatory regions where the transcription factor can bind. So you have a transcription factor that now has several different roles. And then you have several transcription factors interacting together in different roles. And you have availability of chromatin varying in different stages of development. And the networks come out of that. So it's not a single sudden appearance of a network, but a gradual elaboration complication of the interactions between different transcription factors and specific binding sites, which slowly turn into a complex network. Does that answer your question? It's for a discussion, but that is okay. Amazing, amazing talk, amazing answer. Thank you. Thanks. Rican, tenías una pregunta? Yes, I have a question in, in the same direction that Aymer. Uh, about, uh, do we know how the transition to the, this uh, long, long germ uh, segment development uh, that we see in Drosophila mm -hmm. appeared in, in terms of uh, gene, regulator, gene regulatory network? How, mm -hmm. how this uh, gene, re, gene rego, regulatory networks uh, reassemble from a short term mm -hmm. development to a long term development? Okay, so one of the things that, that we showed and several other groups have shown is that the network is actually not that different. The difference between short term and long term can actually be explained by fairly minor changes in, re in the regulation within the network. So it's the same genes, the same interactions, it's just the dynamics and the, the sort of the higher level um, control that varies. There's several people, not from my lab, but um, um, Izzat, um, Izzat the Sharif, who's now in Germany, um, and um, what's his name? Um, Eric, um, Eric Clark, um, who was in Michael Aikam's lab, who are more modelers, sort of more theoretical biologists. And they've actually built some very elegant computational models that take a short germ developing animal, a model animal, of course, a com computerized animal, shift a few parameters and get long -term, term development. So actually the transition is not that complicated. It has to do with using the same network in slightly different, so a slightly different cellular environment, slightly different regulation. So it's, it's much simpler transition than people thought. Thank you. How you said the, what's the name of that people? Uh, is that the Sharif and Eric Clark? Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, maybe not question. Uh, a question not from me, but from Eva Jablonka. She was the last presenter. Uh, yeah. Uh, and she defines development in a way that applies to every single organism, independent of the domain of life. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but do you, uh, and it's most, most, most amazing even because that's the definition for, of development. But she also used that definition of development to say that epigenetics also apply to everything because epigenetics is the study of the genetic of the gene networks and its interaction with the environment. <coughs> All that happening during development. So, okay, so, so Eva Yablonka, as you probably guessed, um, sees everything through the, through the viewpoint of epigenetics. And I think she, she takes a very broad definition of epigenetics, probably a broader definition of epigenetics than I would use and, and many other evolutionary biologists would use. But in the broad definition of epigenetics being the interaction between the environment and the genetic system, development is definitely an epigenetic process. 
because the environment of any given cell is its neighboring cells, right? So uh, every process that's happening in a cell is influenced by the cells around it. And the transitions it undergoes are transitions that very often are related to non-genetic factors, epigenetic factors. So I would, I would accept this definition of, of development being not entirely, I wouldn't, that, would, that wouldn't be my main definition of development, but saying that development is largely an epigenetic process is, is a definition I would accept. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm? We have a question from Ezekiel. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question and um, I'll read it. Do you find any correlation between the morphology complexity of arthropods and the complexity of gene regulatory network? So that's also an excellent question. Um, the debate about what complexity even means is a very, is a very complex debate. Uh, we can talk about that for hours. I think that organisms that have a more complex body probably have more networks. I'm not sure whether the individual networks are in themselves more complex, but an organism that has many different characters and great variability in characters, we would find more separable individual networks. But I don't know, it's a good question. I don't know the answer, whether the networks themselves would be more complex or not. I think that in general, a complex network tends to be more stable and therefore less evolvable. Whereas a less complex network would be more evolvable. So I don't know, it goes both ways. I know Eduardo, do you have any ideas on that? Cause that's also something I think that you've thought about. Yeah, I, no, I don't think there is a straight correlation. I think that uh... My feeling is that a lot of the evolvability has to do with, uh, with uh, robustness due to uh, uh, duplication and, and redundancy. So there is more than one way of doing the same. And also a way that allows you to switch how things are mapped in the network. So if you have two different ways of doing the same, you might normally rely on this one, but you have this one. So when this one fails, you still have things going. But that also gives you uh, an additional. So if this one really, this, you still have your original one and this one can reconnect to something else. And I think that's very interesting how that uh, connects to the idea of developmental system drift, which is the idea that once you have that kind of initial and overall redundancy and duplication of, of, of way to connect things, you can see across evolution how basically the same network pairing the same structure is actually showing differences in how things connect. And which, you know, that adds additional layer of problems with defining homology because even the networks are yeah. uh, the same by descent and yet be different. And so yeah. that screws up a lot more different homology that already screwed up. Yeah, so, so developmental systems drift is actually, I didn't use that term, but a lot of what I showed, so you have homologous structures, segments, but the way the segments are formed varies, then that's true. It's the same network that has changed, but the outcome has remained the same. So that's, that's what developmental systems drift is about. Thanks. Thanks. We have one question uh, on YouTube. Carolina Ferrari has been saying it's a very interesting talk and ask, is asking if you did you observe similar mutant phenotypes in Oncopeltus as in Drosophila when you knock down developmental genes? Uh, so so I, I refer to that in some cases. Some genes, when you knock them down, give similar phenotypes. Other genes give different phenotypes. That's, that's really the interesting story. Um, gap genes, as I showed, give similar phenotypes, but a gene, a gene like even skipped, if you knock it down in Drosophila, you lose every other segment. Whereas on Copeltas, because it has this very early role in determining the posterior, if you knock down even skip, you get half an embryo. So some genes have similar knockdown phenotypes and some genes are different. And that's, that's really our starting point. So wh where do you start thinking about what genes are conserved and which are not? 
what happens when you knock them down? And I have one more. Okay. Do you think that the uh, abdomen of arthropods uh, and perhaps even the thorax can be considered an arthropod novelty since you know they seem to be working as evolutionary units that are somehow unique in their way they're patterned and, and so, you know, in so the temporal the, development. So the insect thorax, the insect thorax I would say is a novelty. It's an insect novelty. The insect abdomen is also a novelty in a sense because it doesn't have appendages, whereas other arthropods have appendages on almost all segments. So yes, the distinction of the thorax abdomen is an insect novelty, not an arthropod novelty, but an insect novelty. Yeah. But then again, novelties, what does that even mean? Yeah, no, it's like a novelty in the end. Yeah. All right, if we have no more questions, it's noon time in Argentina. It's almost 5 p.m., is that correct? Yep. In yeah, time to go Israel. home. So okay. thanks a lot, Ariel. It's thanks been for great having you here.